1 Corinthians chapter 7. Now, getting down to the questions you asked in your letter to me. First, is it a good thing to have sexual relations? Certainly, but only within a certain context. It's good for a man to have a wife and for a woman to have a husband. Sexual drives are strong, but marriage is strong enough to contain them and provide a, for a balanced and fulfilling sexual life in a world of sexual disorder. The marriage bed must be a place of mutuality. The husband seeking to satisfy his wife, the wife seeking to satisfy her husband. Marriage is not a place to stand up for your rights. Marriage is a decision to serve the other. Whether in bed or out, abstaining from sex is permissible for a period of time if you both agree to it and if it's for the purposes of prayer and fasting but only for such times. Then come back together again. Satan has an ingenious way of tempting us when we least expect it. I'm not, understand, commanding these periods of abstinence, only providing my best counsel if you should choose them. Sometimes I wish everyone were single like me, a simpler life in many ways, but celibacy is not for everyone any more than marriage is. God gives the gift of the single life to some, the gift of marriage, of the married life to others. I do though. Tell the unmarried and widows that singleness might well be the best thing for them, as it has been for me. But if they can't manage their desires and emotions, they should by all means go ahead and get married. The difficulties of marriage are preferable by far to a sexually tortured life as a single. And if you are married, stay married. This is the master's command, not mine. If a wife should leave her husband, she must either remain single or else come back and make things right with him. Any husband has no right to get rid of his wife. For the rest of you are who are in mixed marriages, Christian married to non-Christians, we have no explicit command from the master. So this is what you must do. If you are a man with a wife who is not, is not a believer, but who still wants to live with you, hold on to her. If you are a woman with a husband who is not a believer, but he wants to live with you, hold on to him. The unbelieving husband shares to an extent in the holiness of his wife, and the unbelieving wife is likewise touched by the holiness of her husband otherwise. Your children would be left out. As it is, they also are included in the spiritual purposes of God. On the other hand, if the unbelieving spouse walks out, you've got to let him or her go. You don't have to hold on desperately. God has called us to make the best of it, as peacefully as we can. You never know, wife. The way you handle this might bring your husband not only back to you, but to God. You never know, husband. The way you handle this might bring your wife not only back to you, but to God. And don't be wishing you were someplace else or with someone else. Where you are right now is God's place for you. Live and obey and love and believe right there. God, not your marital status, defines your life. Don't think I'm being harder on you than on the others. I give the same counsel in all the churches. Were you Jewish at the time God called you? Don't try to remove the evidence. Were you non-Jewish at the time of your call? Don't become a Jew. Being Jewish isn't the point. The really important thing is obeying God's call following his commands. Stay where you were when God called your name. Were you a slave? Slavery is no roadblock to obeying and believing. I don't mean you're stuck and can't leave. If you have a chance at freedom, go ahead and take it. I'm simply trying to point out that under your new master, you're going to experience a marvelous freedom you would never have dreamed of. On the other hand, if you were free when Christ called you, you'll experience a delightful enslavement to God you would never have dreamed of. All of you, slave and free both, were once held hostage in a sinful society. Then a huge sum was paid out for your ransom. So please don't, out of old habit, slip back into being or doing what everyone else tells you. Friends, stay where you were called to be. God is there. Hold the high ground with him at your side. 
The master did not give explicit direction regarding virgins, but as one much experienced in the mercy of the master and loyal to him, all the way you can trust my counsel. Because of the current pressures on us from all sides, I think it would probably be best to stay just as you are. Are you married? Stay married. Are you unmarried? Don't get married. But there's certainly no sin in getting married whether you're a virgin or not all i am saying is that when you marry you take an on additional stress in an already stressful time and i want to spare you if possible i do want to point out friends that time is of the essence there's no time to waste so don't complicate your lives unnecessarily keep it simple in marriage grief joy whatever even in ordinary things your daily routines of shopping and so on Deal as sparingly as possible with the things the world thrusts on you. This world as you see it is fading away. I want you to live as free as complications as possible. When you're unmarried, you're free to concentrate on simply pleasing the master. Marriage involves you in all the nuts and bolts of domestic life and in wanting to please your spouse, leading to so many more demands on your attention. The time and energy that married people spend on caring for and nurturing each other, the unmarried can spend in becoming whole and holy instruments of God. I'm trying to be helpful and make it as easy as possible for you, not make things harder. All I want is for you to be able to develop a way of life in which you can spend plenty of time together with the master without a lot of distractions. If a man has a woman friend to whom he is loyal but never intended to marry, Having decided to serve God as a single, and then changes his mind deciding he should marry her, he should go ahead and marry. It's no sin. It's not even a step down from celibacy, as some say. On the other hand, if a man is comfortable in his decision for a single life in service to God, and it's entirely his own conviction and not imposed on him by others, he ought to stick with it. Marriage is spiritually and morally right and not inferior to singleness in any way. Although, as I indicated earlier, because of the times we live in, I have, I do have pastoral reasons for encouraging singleness. A wife must stay with her husband as long as he lives. If he dies, she is free to marry anyone she chooses. She will, of course, want to marry a believer and have the blessing of the master. By now, you know that I think she'll be better off staying single. The master, in my opinion, thinks so too. 1 Corinthians chapter 8 The question keeps coming up regarding meat that has been offered up to an idol. Should you attend meals where such meat is served or not? We sometimes tend to think we know all we need to know to answer these kinds of questions, but sometimes our humble hearts can help us more than our proud minds. We never really know enough until we recognize that God alone knows it all. Some people say quite rightly that idols have no actual existence, that there's nothing to them, that there is no other God other than our one God, that no matter how many of these so-called gods are named and worshipped, they still don't add up to anything but a tall story. They say again, quite rightly, that there is only one God, the Father, that everything comes from Him and that he wants us to live for him. Also, they say that there is only one master, Jesus the Messiah, and that everything is for his sake, including us. Yes, it's true. In strict logic, then, nothing happened to the meat when it was offered up to an idol. It's just like any other meat. I know that and you know that, but knowing isn't everything. If it becomes everything, some people end up a know-it-all. Some people end up as know-it-alls who treat others as know-nothings. Real knowledge isn't that insensitive. We need to be sensitive to the fact that we're not all at the same level of understanding in this. Some of you have spent your entire lives eating idle meat and are sure that there's something bad in the meat that then becomes something bad inside of you. An imagination and conscience shaped under those conditions isn't going to change overnight. But fortunately, God doesn't grade us on our diet. We're neither commended when we clean our plate, nor reprimanded when we just can't stomach it. But God does care when you use your freedom carelessly in a way that leads a fellow 
believers still vulnerable to those old associations to be thrown off track. For instance, say you flaunt your freedom by going to a banquet thrown in honor of idols, where the main course is meat sacrificed to idols. Isn't there great danger if someone's still struggling over this issue? Someone who looks up to you as knowledgeable and mature sees you go into that banquet? The danger is that we, he will become terribly confused, maybe even to the point of getting mixed up himself in what his conscience tells him is wrong. Christ gave up his life for that person. Wouldn't you at least be willing to give up going to dinner for him? Because as you say, it doesn't really make any difference. But it does make a difference if you hurt your friend terribly, risking his internal ruin. When you hurt your friend, you hurt Christ. A free meal here and there isn't worth it at the cost of even one of the, these weak ones. So. Never go to these idle tainted meals. If there is any chance, it will trip up one of your brothers or sisters. 1 Corinthians chapter 9 And don't tell me that I have no authority to write like this. I'm perfectly free to do this. Isn't that obvious? Haven't I been given a job to do? Wasn't I commissioned to this work in a face-to-face -face meeting with Jesus our Master? Aren't you yourselves proof? of the good work that I've done for the master? Even if no one else admits the authority of my commission, you can't deny it. Why, my work with you is living proof of my authority. I'm not shy in standing up to my critics. We who are on missionary assignments for God have a right to decent accommodations, and we have a right to support for us and our families. You don't seem to have raised questions with the other apostles and our master's brothers and Peter in these matters. So why me? Is it just Barnabas and I who have to go it alone and pay our own way? Are soldiers self-employed? Are gardeners forbidden to eat vegetables from their own gardens? Don't dairy farmers get to drink their fill from the pail? I'm not just sounding off because I'm irritated. This is all written in the scriptural law Moses wrote. Don't muzzle an ox to keep it from eating the grain when it's threshing. Do you think Moses' primary concern, Moses' primary concern was the care of farm animals? Don't you think his concern extends to us? Of course. Farmers plow and thresh, expecting something when the crop comes in. So if we have planted spiritual seed among you, is it out of line to expect a meal or two from you? Others demand plenty from you in these ways. Don't we have, don't we who have never demanded deserve even more? But we're not going to start demanding now. What we've always had a, perfe a perfect right to. Our decision all along has been to put up with anything rather than to get in the way or detract from the message of Christ. All I'm concerned with right now is that you not use your decision to take advantage of others, depriving them of what is rightly theirs. You know, don't you, that it's always been taken for granted that those who work in the temple give live off the proceeds of the temple, and that those who offer sacrifices at the altar eat their meats from what has been sacrificed? Along the same lines, the master directed that those who spread the message be supported by those who believe the message. Still, I want it made clear that I've never gotten anything out of this for myself and that I'm not writing now to get something. I'd rather die than give anyone ammunition to discredit me or, or question my motives. If I proclaim the message, it's not to get something out of it for myself. I'm compelled to do it and doomed if I don't. If this was my own idea of just another way to make a living, I'd expect some pay. But since it's not my idea, but something solemnly entrusted to me, why would I expect to get paid? So am I getting anything out of it? Yes. As a matter of fact, the pleasure of proclaiming the message at no cost to you, you don't even have to pay my expenses. Even though I am free of the demands and expectations of everyone, I have voluntarily become a servant to any and all in order to reach a wide range of people, religious, non-religious, meticulous, moralists, loose living, Im immoralists, the defeated, the demoralized, whoever. I didn't take on their way of life. 
I kept my bearings in Christ, but I entered their world and tried to experience things from their point of view. I've become just about every sort of servant there is in my attempts to lead those I meet into a God-saved life. I did all this because of the message. I didn't just want to talk about it, I wanted to be in on it. You've all been to the stadium and seen the athletes race. Everyone runs, one wins. Run to win. All good athletes train hard. They do it for a gold medal and that tarnishes and fades. You're after one that's gold eternally. I don't know about you, but I'm running hard for the finish line. I'm giving it everything I've got. No lazy living for me. I'm staying alert and in top condition. I'm not going to get caught napping, telling everyone else all about it, and then missing out myself. Amen. Thank you.